We're in a series right now called 101, and it's all about the basics of Christianity. Um, and, and it's like, I sometimes wonder, do we, do we really need to have a series about just the basics of what it means to be a Christian? And I'm going to tell you right now, if you are not on the regular going back to the basics of what God brought you out of, you'll forget what God brought you out of. Okay, you will forget. And so what it makes you do is, is you notice this in people. I said sometimes I notice um, sometimes God's people are kind of hard to deal with. Right. We mentioned that before. And here's what I think. Here's why that happens. It's because God forgot. They forgot what God brought them out of. And whenever you forget what God's brought you out of, you become entitled and judgmental. And all of a sudden, you start to say, well, how come you're not having the experience that I had like I had it? And if you're not having it like I had it, then you're not having the experience. You've got to chill out with that. Let me tell you why. Because you are an individual person. Every one of you is different. You have your own personality. You have your own thought processes. Some of you are funny. Bro, I love you. But some of y'all ain't funny. You know what I'm saying? Like some of y'all are perfectionists. Some of y'all could care less. Some of you fly by the seat of your pants, and some of you plan so meticulously that even if a bird flies in front of you, you can't stand it. Like, you just, you got to have it exactly right. God will speak to you exactly how he made you. He will speak to you like your personality mix. I'll never forget, I was at Harvest Church in Jasper. This was back in 2002, I guess. And I was leading, I was leading worship, and I was really beating myself up because my prayer life didn't look like the head intercessor that always sat right over here. And one day the Lord spoke to me clearly and said, if I wanted you to pray like her, I'd have made you her. You're Jason, pray like Jason prays. That set me free. That set me free. Why? Because I didn't have to live up to another person's expectations. That's freeing, isn't it? I have one set of expectations to live up to, and that's Jesus Christ. Now, I have voluntarily put myself into a situation where I also want to live up to some of Monique's expectations. To live up to, chill out with that. To live up, up to, <laughs> well, how come the laundry ain't folded, Jason? Well, um, Ephesians, uh, never mind, I'm going to leave that alone. I'm going to leave that alone. I'm going to leave that alone. Submit. No, I'm kidding, I'm kidding, I'm kidding. I've, I've voluntarily put myself uh, under the eldership of this church and under the board of directors of this church. Why? Because I want to be the best I can be. Okay? I want, I want, that's what I want God to do in my life. But I don't have to live up to expectations that are not godly. Okay? I think what Crystal had to say this morning was, was beautiful. was perfect. It was... You don't have to be a perfectionist. In fact, if God wanted you perfect, if God made you perfect, then you wouldn't really have any need for Him. But, but your weakness, you know the beautiful thing about your weakness? Is that that's when God gets to do something great. God, God can't do anything when you're walking in your perfection. But when you're willing to say, you know what, God, I lack in this area. I'm subpar in this area. I'm insufficient in this area. What God does, and there's a book out there called Walk Around Grace, and I talk about this exact thing. He pours his grace into what's missing to level the playing field. That's what God's grace does in your life. Come on, man, that's exciting. But you know what? That's a basic of Christianity. That is not some deep theological truth that you only find after seven years of Bible college. That is basic Christianity. And here's what I've determined. That just like Jordan Peterson says, that most people aren't malevolent. They're not evil. They're just ignorant. They just don't know. I think as a whole, the Christian church in America, the American church, we've forgotten the basics of faith. So that's what we're talking about. Last week we talked about salvation. This week we're going to talk about the blood of Jesus. Come on, somebody. The blood of Jesus. So we've, there are some basics in faith that you might think of. There's, there's things like baptism, infilling of the Holy Spirit. There's faith. There's discipleship, which, by the way, discipleship has been the D word in church. People like the salvation because it feels good, but they don't like the discipleship because it means working some stuff out of you that shouldn't be there. That's, but let me tell you something. If you're going to sign up for salvation, you better sign up for discipleship. Because the Great Commission says, doesn't, doesn't say go save a whole bunch of folks. It says go make disciples. And I want you to know something. If you stopped at salvation, I don't want you to beat yourself up. That's okay. But can I invite you into something deeper that's more beautiful in your relationship with Jesus Christ? That's called discipleship. Yes, it's painful sometimes. But you're better on the other side of it. Your life is so much better as a son than it was as an orphan. And I know it's scary to look across the threshold of what you can't see. It's scary. But God bids us come. That's the faith and discipleship we're talking about. Living the Christian life. All of it starts with salvation, which we talked about last week. So what is the basics of salvation? God loves you. God loves you. 
okay? You're a sinner, dead in sin. In fact, you're an enemy of God before Jesus. So even so, and in spite of your stance with God, he gave his life for you. So if you make him Lord by your confession, then the Bible says that you're saved. That's Romans 10, 9, and 10. That's the basics of salvation. So what happened on the cross is paramount to your salvation, though. What happened at the cross, that's why everybody, I have a little cross on my neck I wear. In fact, my kid, when I first got it, after about three months, she looked at me, Viv said, how long are you going to wear that thing? I was like, have judgment. Um, I wear my little cross. A lot of people have crosses. But the cross is paramount to what God did, to, to our salvation. So what happened? Jesus Christ, God in human flesh, perfect in all his ways. By the way, I said this earlier, but I'm going to say this again. Um, God already had a perfect kid. And he gave his life for you. Stop trying to be perfect. Okay, let me say that. He gave himself as the ultimate sacrifice. He shed his blood for the sin of the entirety of mankind. Jesus shedding his blood is essential to our faith. And I know in modern day 2021, the idea of shedding blood is kind of icky. Where's my, I can't stand the sight of blood, people. Boy, John William, I'm telling you right now, he can cut his foot and he'll be perfectly fine until he sees blood. Then it's like, ah, right? He just loses his mind. Well, blood is icky. We don't really like talking about blood in the 21st century. Like, in, 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 in fact, it's like, my goodness, when uh, there's certain games that I won't let John William play, like Call of Duty games, because like they're too real and there's blood everywhere. And they ain't trying to have blood everywhere. It's like if we shoot a robot and like some robot juice shoots out, that's one thing, but like not blood. You know what I'm saying? Like, because blood is icky today. We don't want to talk about that. But guess what? Without the blood, there's no atonement for sin. Without Jesus' blood, it doesn't matter. We really can't talk, though, about the blood of Jesus without talking about the old tabernacle sacrificial system. And I don't want to bore you with a bunch of details or anything like this, but let me just set this up. There is the sacrificial system that we read about. That the bulk of it is in the book of Leviticus, which if you're new to faith and new to Christianity, I highly don't recommend starting in Leviticus. Like Go to John, you know what I'm saying? Like Get all that before you go into you know, like can't wear, can't wear linen or whatever it is. Um, but there's this, in the sacrificial system, there were three parts of it. So there's the mosaic system, the mosaic uh, sacrifices, the, the tabernacle. We remember the tabernacle that they built out in the middle of nowhere and they had the altar and they had all these different things to show, uh, the, the uh, show stand and the bread and all that stuff, right? Well, there were three basic offerings that were offered. The first one was the burnt offering. We see this in Leviticus chapter 1, verses 6 and 7. This is the entire thing was offered. So you killed the animal, drain the blood, the uh, Yom Kippur, that blood would be sprinkled upon the mercy seat for the atonement of the sins of Israel, which by the way, we're going to talk in a minute about pushing back versus forgiving. But because that's interesting in the Old Testament. But they would kill this animal and it was because sin required a sacrifice. Okay? We'll get into that in a minute. But they would do this and then they would take the entire animal and put the entire animal on the altar. The priest didn't get any of it. The, the offerer didn't get any of it. It was completely and totally consumed. That's the burnt offering. That's the sin offering. Then there is the grain offering. This is Leviticus chapter 2. A portion of it was burnt, but the rest was given to the priests to consume. This was, this was flour, basically, fine flour that they would give. Some of it would go on the altar to cover sin or whatever it was, and then the rest of it would be given to the priests so the priests could have food. Because why? The priests didn't have any land allotment. Remember, the Levites never got any land. Their whole thing was the tabernacle. So the other tribes would come and bring supplies for the priests so that they would be able to survive. And then lastly, there's the peace offering. That's Leviticus 3. Some is offered on the altar, and the rest is given to the offerer to consume with his family as an act of worship. Isn't that interesting? He's, it's given to the family as an act of worship. Well, that was replaced when Jesus came by the Messianic system. Well, how is it replaced? Remember, Jesus did not come to destroy the law. It's very, very important we understand that. This is a basic of Christianity. That doesn't mean that, well, everything in the Old Testament, not, you don't got to do that no more. Well, there are some dietary laws and, and things about what you can wear and cutting hair and all that. Yeah, that doesn't necessarily apply anymore because there were specific reasons. Which Does anybody understand that? Like why God said don't eat pigs? Does anybody understand that? Like We can't understand that because we can go get bacon in the store and it's like heaven. Like I'd be a terrible Jew because bacon, man. Like have you had bacon? Um the reason is because a pig will eat anything. And wild pigs are rife with disease. Okay, so God was protecting them. A prohibition was designed to protect them from something that would hurt them. You've got to be okay with God's prohibitions 
Because they're not designed to keep you from getting what you want. They're designed to keep you from dying. Okay. So Jesus was our burnt offering. Romans 8.32 He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all. Jesus was given his whole life was given as a sacrifice for you. Jesus was our grain offering. The Bible says in John 6.35, Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. Jesus was the flower. Jesus was that offering. And then Jesus was also our peace offering. 2 Corinthians 4.10, always carrying in the body the death of Jesus so that the life of Jesus may also be manifested in our body. See, here's what happened with the peace offering. You gave a portion of it to satisfy the requirement of the law, but you consumed the rest. And when you consumed the rest, the purpose was that you realized that inside of you was being cleansed and made at peace with God because of the sacrifice. Come on, man. Like, that is awesome to think about. In the sacrificial system, you had priests, you had altars, you had the sacrifice. A priest sacrificed on the altar, but what did that get them? Romans 3, 24, in his divine forbearance, he had passed over former sins. We get forgiveness and cleansing of sin. That's what Jesus' sacrifice did. 1 Peter 2, 24, he himself bore our sins in his body on that tree that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. That's what happened. So the difference between the Mosaic sacrificial system and what Jesus did is one passed over and one cleansed. One was a shadow for the righteousness that would come, and one was the righteousness that we get to step into and walk and receive. That's the difference. Interestingly enough, did you know this? Israelites were not allowed to sacrifice anywhere other than the tabernacle. Isn't that interesting? Here's why. The Bible tells us in Leviticus 17. I just This is interesting, and I, I, think, it, I think it shows us something about what Jesus did. Certain verse 3, whatever man of the house of Israel who kills an ox or lamb or goat in the camp or who kills it outside the camp and does not bring it to the door of the tabernacle of the meeting to offer an offering to the Lord before the tabernacle of the Lord, the guilt of bloodshed shall be imputed to that man. He has shed blood and the man shall be cut off from among his people to the end that the children of Israel may bring their sacrifices which they offer in the open field, that they may bring them to the Lord at the door of the tabernacle of meeting to the priest and offer them as peace offerings to the Lord. And the priest shall sprinkle the blood on the altar of the Lord and at the door of the tabernacle of meeting, and burn the fat for, the, for a sweet aroma to the Lord. They shall no more offer their sacrifices to demons after whom they played the harlot. This shall be a statute forever for them throughout their generations. Here's, here's what all that means. They would, they would offer their sacrifices out in the field so they wouldn't have to come to the tabernacle but also because it was a pagan culture in that time a pagan ritual to offer in the field to in the bible some translations actually say the goat demon they were worshiping goats and so what god was saying is like no 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 no. you're going to be holy you're going to be pure i want you to come over here now if y'all remember jesus was crucified where on a hill on golgotha that was not the tabernacle how then can Jesus be our sacrifice? I think Matthew Henry said it best. Jesus Christ is the great propitiation or proprietary sacrifice typified by the mercy seat under the law. He is our throne of grace in and through whom atonement is made for sin and our persons and performances are accepted of God. He is all in all our reconciliation, not only the maker, but the matter of it, our priest, our sacrifice, our altar, our all. That's who Jesus Christ is. He was more than our sacrifice. He was our great high priest. He was the altar. He was the sacrifice. So in, the, in the midst of all of the ceremony and the pomp and the circumstance and the regulations, there's one thing that made all of it a legitimate sacrifice and not just ceremonial. Many people embraced the ceremony, but they re- refused to embrace the sacrifice. You know anybody like that in Christianity? They're all about the fun stuff of Christianity, but they're not about the sacrifice in Christianity. Let me tell you something. When you're all about the fun stuff, when you're all about the ceremony, but you're not about the sacrifice, you don't grow. It's just a show. It's just a, it's just a thing you're doing. It's just a star you get because, hey, you went to church, you did your duty, you did your good thing for the week. Hey, I'm here. I know it. Y'all, hey, make sure I shake three hands so people know I was there. 
You know what I'm saying? Like, and somebody asked me later, hey, did I see you at church? Oh, yeah. Talk to Betty. I shook her hand, right? You get your little star. That's what happens when you get wrapped up in the ceremony. And can I tell you something else? When you are wrapped up in the ceremony and not the sacrifice, you become very concerned about whether or not they're doing that ceremony just right. Hey, you hear me? Let me say it again. When you're wrapped up in the ceremony and not the sacrifice, you get very concerned if they're not doing the ceremony just right. You get very concerned with that. And all of a sudden you begin to say, hey, well, you're not doing this right. Rather than remembering that the sacrifice is what's important. The sacrifice is the thing that changes everything. They want the beauty of the act, but they refuse to engage in what it took to act it out. Thank heaven Jesus wasn't like that. Jesus wasn't all talk and no action. Like that country song's playing in my head right now. He wasn't, he wasn't all ceremony and no sacrifice. He appreciated the ceremony and became the sacrifice. What made the difference? What made the difference was that the blood of Jesus was shed. And that's what went from ceremony to sacrifice. That's why when you sacrifice, you get more out of it. That's the difference between somebody giving you $100 and you making $100. How easy is it to spend $100 that somebody gave you? Like, I can spend it before it's in my hand. But $100 that I make, I'm a little bit more, okay? Somebody gives you $100, like Richard talking about going out with somebody after after the thing, right? Somebody gives you 100 bucks. Oh, yeah, baby, salt grass. Give me that porterhouse, baby, got a hundo. But let it be your dollar, and you'll be getting that Gulf steak and shrimp don't put no mushrooms on it, just like the basics. Give me the ugly steak in the back and give me a discount. You know what I'm saying? Like, that's the difference. Here's the Bible says in Hebrews chapter 9, verse 22. Indeed, under the law, most everything is purified with blood. And without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. We see this enacted all the way back in Eden. If you go all the way back to the Garden of Eden, in Genesis chapter 3, you remember that God made, made clothing for them, basically. Where do y'all think he got that clothing from? It was skins that he made. Where do you think he got that from? Do you think, uh, you know, like a beaver was just walking past his ghost? Like, yeah, y'all need some clothes. Hold on. No, he died. The, the animal died. There was bloodshed to cover them. It's the same situation we see. We see this also with Cain and Abel. You ever wonder why God accepted Cain, uh, uh, Abel's sacrifice but not Cain's sacrifice? Because Abel's was bloodshed. Cain's was just some, some grain. It's all about the blood, guys. We see this plenty of other times in Scripture, but why the blood specifically? Well, we see this in Leviticus chapter 17, verse 11. For the life of the flesh is in the blood, and I've given it for you on the altar to make atonement for your souls. For it is the blood that makes atonement by the life. In the blood there's life. The only way you overcome death is with life. This is precisely what Jesus' sacrifice did for us. Let me read you one more verse, and then I'm going to share some things that can kind of help you put it into perspective. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 11 through 14. But when Christ appeared as a high priest of the good things that have come, then through the greater and more perfect tent, not made with hands, that is, not of this creation, not of this creation he entered once for all into the holy places, not by means of the blood of goats and calves, but by the means of his own blood, thus securing an eternal redemption. For if the blood of goats and bulls and the sprinkling of defiled persons with the ashes of, the, of a heifer sanctify for the purification of the flesh, how much more will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal Spirit offered himself without blemish to God, purify our conscience from dead works to serve the living God? Here's, here's why the blood of Jesus is a basic of Christianity. It's because most of us are walking in our flesh and we're not walking in his blood i got to be honest with you guys, that's easy. That's easy. But it's the blood that purifies our conscience from dead works. You, you remember when you got saved, or maybe you haven't, whatever it is, but it, you, you remember you had that moment where it's like you, you got so excited about your relationship with Jesus, and then over time that excitement kind of waned, and it was just kind of whatever, and, 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 and you remember all the stuff that you used to do, and it's like your mind begins to play back all that stuff, and of course the devil, you know, he's throwing darts at you every chance he gets. And so all of a sudden you find yourself back into something that you were doing. Well, why is that? It's because the blood may have purified your conscience in that moment, but your brain was meant to remember things. You're not designed to forget. You're designed to remember. And if you don't continually apply the blood of Jesus Christ to your life, 
you cannot have that purified conscience. It begins to get tarnished again. A little rust begins to form on it. And will you remember a little rust? Well, I remember if I did this, then this, 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 this. And all of a sudden you find yourself back into it. And two years later, you're back at the church saying, I need to rededicate my life. You've got to walk this thing out. So let's talk about what the blood does in us. And then we're going to end today by taking communion. Amen? Amen. Amen. Number one, his blood redeems us. <laughs> like, duh. Like, this is a no-brainer, right? But we've got to include it. His blood redeems us. 1 Peter 1, 18 and 19. Knowing that you are ransomed from the futile ways inherited from your forefathers, not with perishable things such as silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ, of, uh, like that of a lamb without spot or blemish or spot. Let me tell you something right now. This is, I want you to see this more of just you like receiving forgiveness from the sins of humanity as a whole. I want you to think about your family. And I want you to think about where your family is failing when it comes to their relationship with God. I want you to think about your dad and your mom, your grandparents. I want you to think about your ancestors. And I want you to see, is there alcoholism in that? Is, is there rebellion in that? Is there anger and hatred in that? I want you to know that Jesus' blood, what it does is it doesn't just stop what, com- what came from your human forefathers, like your, the humanity as a whole from Adam, but I'm talking about your immediate family. I don't, I, I'm going to do this because I'm never going to be like my dad. Well, Jesus can free you from that. You don't have to overcorrect into another sin just to stop from going from his sin. So whatever you came in with, like, well, uh, this is just how I am because this is how my dad raised me. It's a family tradition. It stops with the blood of Jesus. So you have to make a decision. Am I going to walk in the? Am I going to get bloody, man? Am I going to, like, just cover myself in the blood of Jesus so that all of that stuff can be completely and totally just ripped away? Or am I going to continue to walk out the family tradition? I don't want to see you walk out a family tradition unless that family tradition is godliness. Walk in the blessing, not the curse, baby. Come on, and the blood is how you break the curse. Sin separates us from God. And, and, and that's the source of the death that defiled us, defined us. Yet God in his great love made a way to be reunited with him. I talked about Matthew Henry before. If you don't know who Matthew Henry was, he was a guy back in the 1500s that did a complete and total commentary on the whole Bible. And I'm talking, it is straight fire. It is the most amazing thing. I, all, I often reference Matthew Henry, because sometimes verses will be like, what you trying to say, Jesus? Like, you, can you just say it plain, man? Well, Matthew Henry kind of clears it up. Um, sometimes. He talks in some funny language, too, sometimes. But here's what he says. God, the party that was offended, makes the first overture towards a reconciliation. Can I just stop right there and say, what? Name one of y'all that you get offended and you go and say, hey, listen, it offended me. Can you? Like, we don't do that. We wait for that moment where we get that, 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 right? I mean, that's. Okay, maybe it's, um, God ain't through with me yet. But God makes the first overture towards a reconciliation. He appoints Jesus in the counsels of his love from eternity, appointed, anointed him to do it, qualified him for it, and has exhibited him to a guilty world as their propitiation by faith in his blood that we become interested in this prop- propitiation. Christ is the propitiation. There is the healing plaster provided by the one that was offended. Let me ask you something. If, if you do good, do you think that you should get a good reward for that? You know, let's, let's, talk, let's not talk about Christianity. Let's talk about your job. If you're a good employee, should they compensate you well? Like, should, do you ex- expect maybe a raise at some point, a commendation, something, a pat on the back? Hey, brother, you did a great job on that report. D- does anybody ever expect that? You know what Jesus got for his being good? He became sin. So anytime you get to a place in your life where you say, I'm doing good and how come God isn't stepping up? Will you just apply some blood to your life real quick? Because here's the thing. Jesus is the only one that can legitimately say that to his daddy. We're not. We have a lot of reasons why God could have just kept on walking. But he's the one that made the overture. If there's never been a reason in your life to say yes to Jesus, can it just be this? Can it just be the fact that you're the one that offended him, but he still wants to save you? Man, this redemption was God's plan all along. Ephesians 1, 7 and 10. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished upon us 
and all wisdom and insight, making known to us the mystery of his will, according to his purpose, which he set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time, to unite all things in him, things in heaven and things on earth. How can God know what I'm going to do? Because he's already lived time. And before the final day of earth ever has come, God has already made a plan in the beginning for you and for your mess up. Yes, the stuff that you're going to do this week. That's not an encouragement to go do sin this week, but I want you to know something. When you stumble this week, God's already made an allowance, already made a plan for what you're about to do. That's, that's his love for us. But I'm going to tell you, if we don't remember that his blood redeemed us, we don't constantly keep that in the forefront, what happens is we forget the power of that, and his redemptive power becomes less and less important in our lives. Don't get to that place. Number two, his blood brings us into fellowship with God. Ephesians 2.13, but, but now in Christ Jesus, you who sometimes were far off are made nigh by the blood of Christ. We weren't made for righteousness, we were made for relationship. That's something that I said last week. I know there's that worship song out there that says, I was made to worship, I was made to bless you. Yeah, a little theologically inaccurate, just telling you, you weren't made to worship. God already has worship. You're made for a relationship with Him. Worship is a byproduct of your relationship with Him. Worship is a byproduct of your experiences with Him. Go eat something good at a restaurant and you'll tell everybody about it. Have a good moment with Jesus and you'll tell everybody about it. That's what worship is. But you were, not, you were not even made for righteousness. If you were made for righteousness, you'd have been righteous, but you're not righteous. So God fixed the problem. Why? Why did he fix it? Why? Why would he do that? The relationship. If you see your wife in, in a struggle, do you just say, well, she's getting what she deserves? <laughs> You know what? Your relationship with her makes you want to help her. How much more does God do that with us? How much more? Because as much as I love my wife, as much as I love my kids, I will never love them as much as God loves them. Never. So even in my frail humanity, wanting to help my wife, wanting to help my kids, God even more does that with us. And he draws us close to him because of this relationship. Righteousness made relationship possible. But we couldn't attain righteousness by ourselves. But the shed blood of Christ does that. And when the shed blood of Christ of Jesus, uh, shed blood of Jesus Christ is applied to your life, what happens? Sin is dealt with. And what happens? The gap closes. And all of a sudden, you're brought back into fellowship with God. Remember I said that Jesus, there was the burnt offering, the grain offering, the peace offering. Jesus' blood allows that peace offering to happen. That means some of it was given as a sacrifice, but the rest of it was meant to be enjoyed in a meal as fellowship. That's what God wants to do with us. So God wants us to look at Jesus like his peace offering. Some of it was for my sin, but some of it is to have relationship with God. And, believe it or not, with God's people. Yes, those stinky, mean sometimes people. Yes, those imperfect people. Yes, the, you get it. God wants you to have a relationship with them. Do you know why? Because you're never going to become who God made you to be without God and without God's people. And if you think you can do it, just me and Jesus have my thing, you are wrong. Even Jesus Christ didn't do it alone. And baby, you ain't Jesus. Even Jesus didn't do it by himself. 1 Corinthians 1, 9. God is faithful by whom you were called into the fellowship of his Son, Jesus Christ. I'm going to tell you something right now. You're never going to get into fellowship with, the, with, with God, with the Father, without Jesus Christ, His Son. That's the way you do it. All right? Number three, His blood makes peace with God. Makes peace with God. Colossians 1.20. And having made peace through the blood of His cross, by Him to reconcile all things to Himself. Remember, you were an enemy of God. Why? Because you were a sinner. And you couldn't stop sinning. I don't care how cute you look. You can't stop. Can't stop, won't stop. That's, that's, that's the problem. So what happened? God took care of it. God, God took care of it. How? Through the blood of his son, Jesus Christ. This is, this is the, uh, excuse me. Um, we were enemies of God before we received Jesus. The shed blood of the Prince of Peace not only brings peace to our hearts and lives, but peace between the two that were enemies, you and God, who are now family. You see, God doesn't take an enemy and turn him into a friend. He takes an enemy and turns him into family. Isn't that amazing? You got any enemies? You ready to invite them into your family? That's what God did. It's amazing. 
Romans 5, 1 and 2. Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through him we have also obtained access by faith into his, uh, into his grace in which we stand. And we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. See, this peace comes through faith in Jesus and that justifies us. Even if you're low on faith, and this is amazing to me, even if you're low on faith, Jesus not only provides the justification, he provides the faith as well. It says it right there in the verse. Through him we have also obtained access by faith into his grace. Through him, through him we have obtained access to this faith. So not only through Jesus Christ and through his blood do we get redemption, but we also get faith to believe that he can redeem us. Like he's thought of it all. If you're going somewhere, it's like, well, we brought the food, but man, we forgot plates. Jesus brought plates. He brought the silverware. He brought the drinks. He brought all of it. Number four, his blood cleanses. <clears throat> First John 1 John 1.7 But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus his son cleanses us from all sin. This is the primary difference between the Mosaic sacrificial system and what Jesus' blood does for us. I remember I talked before about the Passover thing we're going to talk about here in a minute. Here it is. We've, we've seen in Hebrews 9 that the blood of animals cannot forgive sin. Does this mean that in the Old Testament God pushed back sin? Or did he overlook sin? If, 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 he, if he pushed back sin, then how can he say to David and to countless other ones, I forgive you or you're forgiven? Because the Bible says that. There's plenty of times in the Bible it says you're forgiven in the Old Testament. So how could that work out? Well, it's overlooked. It's, and what I mean by overlooked is not like, oh, just like I just didn't see it. That's not what I'm talking about. Here's what it means. G, what God did is he, in one point in history and time, before Jesus Christ came, he looked over all of the sin of Israel to the point where his son would be sacrificed and retroactively applied Forgiveness all the way back to the beginning. Now, how he determined who, who got the forgiveness and who didn't, I'm going to leave that to him. That's a, bigger, that's a bigger task than I can handle. But I'm going to tell you what right now. Jesus Christ's blood cleanses us. The Old Testament forgiveness was contingent upon Jesus' future sacrifice. The Mosaic sacrifice was the foreshadowing of the great sacrifice. Just like the angel of death passed over the door of the Israelites and those with the blood on their doorposts, God passed over the sins of Israel to get to Jesus. Remember, God exists outside of our time schedule, doesn't he? And it's really hard to, it's really hard to parse that. It's really hard to consider that. But he does. So the real question here, though, is not whether or not the Israelites were forgiven in the Old Testament before Jesus' sacrifice. The real question is, are you going to embrace forgiveness and cleansing because of Jesus' sacrifice? We over here worried about if Moses was forgiven, are you forgiven? Are you walking in the blood of Jesus? Are you, are you being cleansed by his blood? Only Jesus' blood can forgive sin, but only if you apply it. Medicine doesn't work unless you take it. Food doesn't give you benefit unless you consume it. Amen? And lastly here, his blood gives us power over the enemy. We like this one. Revelation 12, 11, And they have conquered him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. I just mentioned that Jesus' sacrifice can't benefit you unless you receive it. And what this does is it sets a precedent that if you combine his blood with something, you get something else. Okay? So this is not this is not to say that his blood isn't enough. That's not what I'm saying. But what I'm saying is when you combine it with something else, you get something else. So when I combine it with my confession, what I get out of it is salvation. But what happens when I combine it with my testimony? Right? Well, when you pair the blood with your declaration, chains are broken. When you compare blood with your confession, you're saved. When you compare the blood with, with, with your repentance, you're forgiven. When you pair the blood with your testimony, you're victorious, right? So testimony is simply a word that says, I bear witness. It's like that's when we go to court, we have a, somebody gives a testimony, says, I, I, saw, you know, I, I saw what happened. Well, in your life experience, what are the things that you've seen God do which you've borne witness? Stop for just a moment and ask yourself, what have I seen God do in my life? What have you seen God do? I remember when John the Baptist was in jail and Jesus was going about healing people and all that stuff. And John sent some of his people and said, hey, will you go ask and see if this is the one, if this is the Messiah? You remember what Jesus, what Jesus responded? He said, go and tell John what you've seen and heard. The blind receive their sight, the lame walk. Lepers are cleansed and the deaf hear. The dead are raised up. The poor have good news preached to them. Let me ask you again, what have you seen God do? 
What have you seen him do? If you've been a witness to what God has done, what he's already done, then what you can do is you can declare what God will do. That's, that's the point. So, so our testimony is not just, this is what Jesus has done for me. Our testimony can be, this is what Jesus will do. Why? Because we've already seen what he's done. So whatever mountain you're facing right now, whatever is going on in your world right now, I want you to take what God has already done in your life, and I want you to apply that same faith, that testimony in the blood, to what you're experiencing right now, to what you see coming down the road. If the blood has done it before, church, the blood will do it again. Come on, that's the truth of the matter. And if the blood has done all these things before, and if Jesus has done all these things before, what makes you think he's not going to do it again? See, our God is faithful. He can be trusted. He's not like a human that will tell you one thing and do another thing. He does what he says he'll do. It doesn't change. You know, he forgave me that thing before, but I fell back into it. I don't know if he, he, the blood did it before, the blood will do it again. That's what we got to do. If you're powerless to, to just think about what God has done. And you'll find that the blood, the power of the blood comes alive inside of you. You know something? You're, you're powerless, though, if you just face the enemy with your testimony alone. It's got to be with the blood. Add the blood to it. You see, we see this in Scripture because the altar was powerless. Until you added the blood to it, right? The sacrifice was powerless. Until you added the blood to it got to add the blood to it. Repentance, oh, I'm sorry, God, powerless until you add the blood to it. So that's what I'm asking you to do today. Moses told us in Genesis that Abel's blood cried out to God. What would Jesus' blood say to you today? Think about it. What would his blood say? I think I know what he would say, and, and I think we see it every time we take communion, and I've just written, I just thought about that myself when I was writing this down, and I thought, what would your blood say? And here's what I think his blood says. Here's my body. Take it. Here's my blood. My gift to you. My life for yours. My blood for your sin. Come. Take it. It's yours. That's what his blood would say, and that's what his blood is saying. You have to make a decision. Would you bow your heads for a moment? Close your eyes. As always, the reason I ask you to do this is just so you can have a moment undistracted with you and the Lord. Who would say yes to Jesus today? Who would say yes to what he's offering? His life for yours. His righteousness for your unrighteousness. His perfection for our sin. There's nobody looking around right now. And I, I just want to know if there's anybody in this room right now that would be willing to say, you know what, I need to make Jesus Christ Lord of my life. I need to apply the blood of Jesus Christ to my life. I want you to just raise your hand. Nobody's looking. Praise you, God. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Praise you for it, God. Here's what I want you to do. If, if, if you raise your hand today, here's what I want you to do. I just want you to say to the Lord, I want you to say, Jesus I know that you died on the cross for my sins. I know that you were my sacrifice. And right now, I confess you as Lord Jesus. I confess you as Lord. I receive what your blood has to offer today. I repent of my sin. And I make you Lord of my life, Jesus, in this moment. I give you everything I am. Today and forever. Thank you for saving me, Jesus. It's in your name I pray. Amen. I always say this, but if you meant that, God meant it. It meant that you're saved. That means, that means right now you've got a blood transfusion. It's, a completely, it's completely different. Now, we've got a lot to work, walk out. There's discipleship that comes next. So here's what I want you to do today. Just before you leave, will you just... But you just pull somebody aside and say, hey, I made, a, I made a decision for Jesus today. Maybe you don't want to tell anybody. Go online to our website. Fill out one of the little cards and put it in the box in the back. Just let somebody know because we can't help you get to the next level until you tell somebody what's happened right now. And besides, man, we just want to, we want to celebrate with you, man. Like, come on. It's the best decision you ever make. It's literally the best decision. 
well, my wife, you married my wife is my best decision. Bro, your wife ain't going to get you to heaven, son. You know what I'm saying? Like, chill out. I'm so excited about that, though. I'm so excited about the decision you made today. Amen?